<clears throat> in a dark picture of Israel, Micah says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make the people stray, who call peace or chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. The false prophets, Micah is saying, eat to the full, being fed by the people because they are giving the people what they want. Prophesy peace, peace, as Jeremiah says, when there is no peace. But they make war against the true prophet who does not feed them with lies. In verse 6, chapter 5, Micah says, Therefore you shall have night without vision. You shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and they shall, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners uh, abashed. As indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. The day of prophecy, Micah is saying, is going to end. God will cease speaking to you. It's going to be a dark day. But Micah says, for now, I'm not like those false prophets. I come to you with the power of the Spirit of the Lord. Listen to it, verse 8, chapter 5. But truly, I am of full power by the Spirit of the Lord, and the justice and, and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and who pervert all iniquity, who build up Zion and bloodshed and, and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, her prophets divine for money, and you lean upon the Lord and say, is the Lord not among us? No harm can come among us, because we are the people of God. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountains of the temple of, uh, like the bare hills of the forest. Micah's a pretty tough prophet. But among all the judgment that he proclaims throughout his, his prophecy, he gives us some of the most beautiful pictures of the church. A, a picture in Micah chapter 4 that's duplicated in Isaiah chapter 2. Listen to it. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow unto it. A good Bible study for you to do would be to figure out or to understand that term, the latter days, how it's used in the Old Testament, how it's used in the New Testament. But in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain, shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, shall the law, the law shall go forth. And that, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. <clears throat> He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke nations afar off. They shall bear or beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But every one shall sit under his own vine, under his own fig, and there shall and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken for the people of uh, walk each in his for the people, that is the nations, walk each in the name of his God, but we walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those who, whom I have afflicted, I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. What a beautiful passage. Premillennialists that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, they, they just destroyed this passage, but it's really speaking about the peace that is in the church, the reign of the king, the king of kings and lord of lords in the church. And in the church, we have peace. Does that mean we not have, do not have persecution? No. Does that, not, does that mean that there will never, never be problems in the church that are brought upon the church by its own divisiveness? No. But if we are faithful in God, or while we are in faithful in God, we have peace. We will beat our uh, swords into plowshares and, and so forth. We, we're we not fighting against each other anymore. The people uh, from all nations will come. You can hear in our congregation that I worship with in Doraville, Georgia, we have people from India, we have people from Africa, not just people who have been in America from Africa for hundreds of years, but people who are actually from Africa this generation. Uh, we have people from Indonesia, not Indonesia, uh, Guyana, 
We have people from Mexico all and, and several different countries in uh, South and Central America. Uh, we have people from what? Well, all over the United States. And we come here and we, we have peace with each other. We're not prejudiced against each other. Uh, we're not uh, fighting each other. We have peace because we have submitted ourselves to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I think that's exactly what Micah and Isaiah both are, are prophesying. The millennialists, the premillennialists are uh, looking forward to some future kingdom where on, wherein all that's going to take place, but that it's, it's now. It's in the kingdom of God, which is the church today. These are but a few of the wonderful gems that we can find in the powerful prophecy of, of Micah. If you've never studied the book, if you've never read the book, it's time you did. But it, it's a powerful, wonderful book. He prophesies alongside of Amos and Hosea and Isaiah during the times of the kings that those men prophesied. Um, he speaks both to Israel and to Judah. Uh, and some of the people, or some people say that he preached that uh, preached for uh, about 50, 50 years. Can you imagine what wonderful opportunities they had during those years to prepare themselves to meet God? Well, in chapter one, the prophet begins with calling attention to the people uh, that God is, is coming down. God's coming down to, to speak to you. He's coming down to execute judgments against uh, the kingdoms of both Israel and Judah. First against Samaria, the capital of Israel, whose faith the uh, prophet laments and uh, speaks of uh, the, the, the cries of foxes and ostriches mourning over what God's going to be doing in uh, Samaria. Then he speaks uh, against Jerusalem, which is threatened with the invasion of Sennacherib later on. Other cities will also be threatened in, in Judah. The, the danger is such that the people of Judah will appeal to even the Philistines or Gaza, Gaza uh, for protection or for help, uh, even though they had for years prior to that concealed their situation concealed their iniquity or tried to. But none of the efforts will help, as uh, Micah says, Israel and Judah will go into captivity. In chapter two, the prophet de uh, denounces a uh, woe against the plotters of wickedness, the, the covetousness, the oppressor, a, a common theme found throughout the uh, Old Testament that you know, a lot of times we focus on their idolatry and this is what caused them to go into captivity. That was part of it, but a major part of it as well is the covetousness and the oppression that these people did. God saved them from oppression. And their response to God's salvation over the centuries was that they would oppress others. They would covet the, the things of another person and they would oppress them. They were just vile and wicked. And so the, the prophet uh, prophesies against them for that. In, in verse three, he says, against this family, God does, God's saying this through uh, Micah, I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily. You're not going to be proud anymore. You're not going to be able to take this yoke off because I'm putting this uh, on you. An Israelite uh, is then introduced as a mourner impersonating the people and lamenting their fate in verse four. And the, their, their total expulsion, he says in uh, verse five, I think you will have no one to determine the boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. In other words, you're going to be pushed out completely. There's no one who's going to be able to even assign you a piece of property. They are threatened on account of their numerous offenses that are mentioned in uh, uh, verses five through 10. But they don't want to hear these judgments uh, against them, uh, and they favor the the false prophets, the pretenders, rather than the divine those of divine inspiration, and who prophesy those false teachers prophesy them, to them peace and plenty and wonderful. Verse eleven. Listen to him. If a man should walk in a false spirit, 
and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you wine and drink, even he would be the prattler or the prophet of this people. That's the kind of people they want. But tell us how good we're going to have it. Tell us how much wine we're going to drink. Tell us how plentiful things are going to be. Chapter 2 concludes with a, a gracious promise of the restoration of uh, Jacob and uh, from captivity. And some see this as a literal returning of Israel to her land. And it may imply that there is some of that. But, but I see this as Micah looking farther into the future, making a prophecy concerning the church. Listen to it. I will assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of the pasture. They make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who breaks open will come before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go by it. The king will pass before them without, with the Lord at their head. So I think he's talking about the church. Uh, there is no king that comes back into uh, Israel other than uh, Jesus Christ. And Israel as a nation was dispersed at the, by the Assyrians, and they never came back. They haven't yet. And the premillennialists say, well, they're going to come back in, in the kingdom. I think he's talking about here the church. The spiritual Jew, the spiritual Israel, he's not, uh, in the New Testament, we're not Gentile and Jew anymore. We are one in Christ. And Paul says that we're grafted in. We as Gentiles, we as a nation are grafted in with, with Israel. What Israel? The uh, physical lineage of, of, of Abraham? No. But with the faithful of the, who had the spirit of faith of Abraham. Well, chapter three. Uh, the prophet speaks with great boldness and spirit against the princes and prophets of Judah. He's been speaking to Israel, now he's speaking to Judah, and he foretells their uh, destruction in Jerusalem and the consequences of their uh, iniquity. The last verse uh, was fulfilled uh, to a certain extent by Nebuchadnezzar, but I think even more so by the Romans and under Titus. It says, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountains of the temple like bare uh, hills of the forest. Then in chapter five, four, we find in the commitment, commencement of this chapter, I, I, I think a glorious prophecy of the establishment of the prosperity of the Messiah's kingdom. It's a uh, peaceful uh, character increasing uh, it, it's just a wonderful passage that gives us uh, the nature of the true kingdom of God it's everlasting uh, duration it's universal uh, universal uh, quality uh, he breaks forth in a uh, course of his people declaring the uh, happiness of the members of the kingdom in verse 5. The prophet returns to the subject of predicting the the restoration of the future of, uh, of Israel. And again, I, I want to make that application to um, uh, the church primarily and maybe secondarily to that of the people of the Jews. We will be victorious over all our enemies. A, a thing we are told in the prophets, a thing we're told in the book of Revelation. In chapter 5, the uh, uh, computer just messed up. He begins with a, uh, what some people say is a uh, prophecy concerning the siege of uh, Jerusalem uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and I don't have a great disagreement with that. We have uh, next a very famous prediction of the uh, birth of Christ. Uh, probably the one verse that everybody knows from uh, Micah is Micah chapter 5 verse 2 where it speaks of Bethlehem Ephrathah and out of him will come the one from everlasting the, the Messiah. The, the Jews continue to uh, be anxious concerning their Messiah but they have a misunderstanding they did then they do now of what that Messiah uh, is or what he's supposed to be what is his purpose, what he, what he hopes to uh, accomplish. Um, 
verses seven and eight, I think is a most beautiful picture of uh, evangelism that we can find in the prophets, maybe even in the Bible. Listen to him. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples like a lion among the beast of the forest. I think he's talking about what we should be. We, we should be this blessing of God like the dew on the uh, grass or the, the, the uh, showers on the grass. We should be a blessing to the world like that. Jacob shall be among the nations. Israel shall be among the nations. We are that Israel. We are that Jacob in the midst of people, like a lion uh, among the beasts of the forest. The rest of the chapter is, again, I think a prophetic vision of the church. Uh, her enemies uh, are going to all be overthrown. I think, again, the Revelation picture, the picture from the book of Revelation, uh, where there is no more tears, no more death. Sin has been overcome, overcome by the power of the blood of the Lamb. We have no more reason for mourning. That's not to say that people who are Christians don't mourn over the death of their loved ones. It's saying that we have no more reason for mourning over the spiritual death of sin or because of sin, because sin has been overthrown. Sin has been overcome. We are the overcomers in the book of Revelation, and that's what he's talking about here in Micah chapter 5. In chapter Six, he returns to his reproving and threatenings of what God is going to do. I don't threatening is probably a bad word. His promises of uh, judgment, and it's set up like a like a courtroom where Israel is uh, urged to present its case with all nature being called upon to witness. Listen to him. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint and the strong foundations of the earth, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. You plead your case, but first you need to listen to me. Oh, my people, here's the Lord's testimony. Here's what I declare. Israel, what do you have to say? Nothing. Well, let me, let me tell you what I have to say. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me, for I have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I have redeemed you from the house of bondage. I have set before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, counseled and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Achaia Grove to uh, Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. I've been in your favor. I've been trying to help you for all these hundreds of years. I've been on your side. Well, what is God looking for in response to all that God has done for Jacob, all that God has done for Israel? Well, look at verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with, a thousand, with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the, body of, uh, the fruit of my body for the son of my soul? Has he not shown you, or has he shown you, or he has shown you, old, old man, what is good? He has shown you what does the Lord require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's all God's ever wanted. Yes, sacrifices were required, and there was reason given for those sacrifices, and it was all looking for them and anticipating the coming of Christ. But what he has wanted from them from the beginning, do justly, treat your fellow man in right ways, in fair ways, in equitable ways. Love mercy. When you find someone in suffering, suffering love mercy. Don't just Pity them, oh, you poor thing, but love mercy. Extend it and walk humbly with God. Folks, that's the New Testament Christianity in prophecy right there. If we can do those three things, we have encompassed what New Testament Christianity teaches. When we become a part of Christ, a part of who God is through baptism for the remission of our sins and turning our hearts from sin and turning our hearts to God and letting him be Lord, we are a people who will because we have been transformed in our heart, we will do justly, we will love mercy, and we will walk humbly with God. We will change this world. The world is not changing because we are not doing that. Well, there's my rant for today. 
Micah chapter 7, the prophet begins this chapter with uh, a lamenting of the decay of faithfulness, the decay of true worship, uh, the decay of uh, godliness, the growth of ungodliness. He, he uses a, a really interesting allegory in verses 1 and 2. He says, a good man in Israel or Judah is, uh, is as unlikely to be found as a good fig in the late season. When you want a good fig, you pick out the, the, the first fruits. But if you come late in the summer, there's not any good figs left, only the ones that are dried up and not as good, that are worm infested. A good man in Israel is as unlikely to be found as a good fig in late season, or it is as unlikely, he is as unlikely to be found as a cluster of grapes after the harvest. There's no more clusters. You may find a, a grape here and a grape here and a grape there, but you're not going to find any clusters. And in the same way, you can't find any good men in Israel. You can't find any good men in Judah during this time. Verses 3 and 4 give us an ugly picture of just how bad they were. It says they successfully do evil with both hands. Not just one hand, but both hands. Their princes ask for gifts. Their judge seek a bribe. The great man utters all his evil desire. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a, a thorn hedge. There's nothing good. The best ones are thorns and, and briars. The day of punishment comes. Micah says it will not be pretty. The people, the society, the culture will be filled with treachery. Jesus makes a point from this uh, particular passage. Micah says the day of your, of your watchman and your punishment comes, now shall be their perplexity. Do not trust your friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For the son dishonors the father. Uh, daughters rise against the mother. Daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A man's enemies are his own household. In other words, when the end comes, this is the way it's going to be. Jesus says the same thing uh, concerning the coming of Rome against uh, Jerusalem. It's going to be a time of treachery, a time of betrayal, an awful time. But the prophet doesn't end with a picture of judgment. He, he, he ends with a promise of God's mercy and God's faithfulness and the a picture of the people anticipating it. Look at verse 7, Micah 7, verse 7. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring forth me forth the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. The faithful remnant, the faithful Jew, Micah himself, I think he's looking forward to that time that God will forgive, God will reign, and the world will see. Wonderful passage. Verses 10 or 11 through 17 predict a time of prosperity and increase, I think, to be applied uh, to the, uh, the church. And we're speaking of spiritual prosperity, spiritual peace. I think this is the blessings that come of God that come uh, within the church. If you want to make an application to Israel or Judah's return, you can do that, I suppose. But I think Micah is looking further into the future, and he concludes with a beautiful hymn of praise of thanksgiving that should be upon our lips. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion upon us and subdue our iniquities. You cast, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will uh, give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, whom or which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. My God. Powerful prophecy. And uh, yes, it has to do with Israel and their iniquity. It has to do with Judah and their iniquity. But I think Micah has to do with the kingdom of God speaking to us today. I hope when you come to this passage, when you come to this text and your textual studies, that you will be able to see all the glories of this passage. 
All I can do today because of our time is give you a brief introduction to it. Speaking of brief introductions, uh, Hosea, wonderful prophet, uh, probably one of the most um, dramatic uh, prophecies or prophets in all of uh, Israel. Ezekiel had some drama in him. He would play different parts, but here in Hosea, God comes to Hosea and he says, I want you to take a wife of whoredom. In the first three or four chapters, he takes this wife who is a prostitute. <clears throat> by order of God, by command of God, he marries a prostitute and has uh, children by her. She also has children out of wedlock. And uh, it, it, it's a horrible picture. And for God to have asked this of Hosea was a huge, huge thing. But Hosea did it. Uh, he trusted God and he did what God said. But the woman was unfaithful to him as was anticipated that she would be. She had children that were not Hosea's children. It's just an awful picture, a wrecked marriage from the beginning. But in the remaining chapters of Hosea, God says, this is the life that I have lived. He shows Hosea through Hosea's marriage what God feels like. Hosea could, when he went through this process, when he went did what God said do, he felt that pain. He understood the pain of, of a uh, love gone sour. He understood the pain of marriage and, and, and unfaithfulness in that marriage. He understood to the degree that when God said, now Hosea, I want you to go tell the people what I feel like. If Hosea had taken that message of chapters five through the end of the book to Israel, and that's who he preached to was Israel. If he had taken that message to the Northern tribes of Israel without the illustration, he could have preached the truth, but it would not have come through as passionately. I think God helped Hosea's prophecy by giving him this situation, this scenario to be alive in his life. I don't think God was punishing Hosea. I think God was giving Hosea the opportunity to passionately describe to people of Israel just how bad things were. And for God to, uh, and I don't know how else to uh, phrase it, I don't mean to imply impugn God in any way, but for God to have stooped to this level of illustration is saying just how bad things were. Because even with Hosea's passion and uh, having lived through the illustration and was living through it during the time of his prophecy, when he was going there and telling these people, and these people were saying, look at Hosea, he's got a wife who's a prostitute and she's uh, fornicating and committing adultery and, and, and but Hosea says, that's you. That's what you're doing to God. And the people had no compassion. The people had no heart. The people would not turn. It's a passionate, passionate prophecy. And because of our limit of time, that's all I'm going to do with the book of Hosea. I don't want you to think that Hosea is not a prophet on which we need to spend more time, but it's not our place in this class to do that. It's our place in this class to give you a, an idea of what the prophecy uh, is about. And uh, I think if we get those two points or those two things, first the illustration and then God saying, I have lived that. Not only had, did Hosea live this before you, but I have lived this for several hundred years you being unfaithful to me as my wife. God hates divorce. But eventually Israel had to be put away because she would not return. All right, that's all I got for uh, this week. Uh, we'll come back next week. I intended, I, I don't remember actually, uh, if I covered the book of Jonah uh, last week. It was my intention to uh, get Jonah last week and um as I was reviewing uh, this morning, uh, I 
began to think that I skipped Jonah. So maybe we'll come back to Jonah. He's one of the early uh, prophets. He did not prophesy to uh, Israel. He prophesied to uh, Nineveh. Um, he's one of the uh, prophets who didn't actually speak to the Jews, but he spoke to the uh, Ninevites. And I think it's a wonderful picture of God in, that in the Old Testament, he was concerned with more than just the Jews. He was concerned with the other nations, Nineveh being one of them. And that they did repent at that time. They later forsook that repentance and God did judge them. Uh, but in the time of Jonah, uh, they, they did repent. And I think the book of Jonah, the prophecy of Jonah was as much um, a prophecy against Jonah as it was against uh, Nineveh. Uh, Jonah was prejudiced. Uh, he wouldn't go to uh, Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, but God uh, had other plans, and he, he wanted Nineveh to hear the gospel of that time, and Jonah finally uh, did take it to them. And I think as Jonah writes, in my opinion, autobiographically, he, he's looking at how bad Jonah was. I don't think the there at the end of the book where he uh, He's hoping God will bring judgment upon them. Uh, I think as he's reflecting upon that, he's seeing what a fool I was. I mean, God had mercy upon me. Why wouldn't I want him to have mercy upon someone else? All right, I think I've extended my time uh, too much uh, today. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to being with you in our studies uh, next week. God bless.